Hello, everyone, and apologies for the last minute change. Um, unfortunately, Tanya Gross can't be here. So I'm going to just give a very brief introduction to our speakers today. We are very lucky to have some of the authors of the OER Starter Kit for Program Managers with us. Um, three, the three authors who are with us today are Jeff Gallant, Aperva Ashok, and Marco Cypherly Valencia, and I'm sorry if I <laughs> mispronounced any of those. They're going to share the resource with us, highlight how they sustain it, and then take any questions that you have. Um, so with that, I'm going to just turn it over to them. Uh, Aparva, do you want to take us away as our, our introduction and our lead here? <laughs> oh, sure. Well, welcome, everybody. It's so great to see so many of you here today. My name is Apurva Ashok. Um, as you might have noticed from the chat, I'm joining you from um, Toronto, or what is actually the traditional territories of um, many nations here, including the Mississaugas of the First Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Wendat peoples, and the Haudenosaunee. Um, it is a very beautiful day. I'm not quite sure what the temperature would convert to in Fahrenheit, but the sun is out, and I'm grateful to be joining you from uh, such a lovely land. Uh, as you can see from this particular slide, um, we have five editors of the OER Starter Kit, two of whom are joining me here today. So Marco and Jeff, um, I'll pass it over to you so you can introduce yourselves and then we can get started. Well, hi, I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program manager. Well, oh yeah, I keep saying that. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Um, and yeah, we have about 26 institutions down here. Um, all of our four-year institutions in the state of Georgia are a part of this affordable learning efforts. Uh, we do a lot of grants and then we report a lot of data as, as a result of that. Thanks, Jeff. And I'm Marco Saifley Valencia. I'm the Open Education Librarian at the University of Idaho. That's also where I'm joining you from, Moscow, Idaho, which is the homelands of the Nez Perce, the Palouse, and the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to have such a great audience to talk uh, through some of these ideas with. Thank you both. Um, and as, as the slide says here, uh, I work at the Rebus Foundation. I'm the Assistant Director and Director of Open Education here. Um, Two of our editors, Stephanie Buck and Abby Elder, could not be here today, but they've contributed a lot to what we're going to share with you. And I also see some of our authors in the audience and in the participants uh, on this call. So please feel free to jump in as we uh, go through today's session. And Jeff will just walk us through an introduction to the book that we're going to be talking about, as well as the agenda for the day. Yeah, so the OER Starter Kit for Program Managers is um, kind of a, it, it's a big resource for anyone who is starting up or continuing or trying to make their OER initiative um, sustainable, either at their institution or in a system or a consortium too. Uh, we had a couple of different use cases in mind when we put this together. Uh, one of them was just basic professional development. Um, there are uh, many different aspects to a position like this, uh, many of which you may not have encountered uh, in any kind of school that was training you for a position um, before then. So that's uh, one way to look at it. Uh, another one is if you're bringing somebody new in and they need some onboarding, um, this can be a great way to introduce them to the world of uh, running an OER program. Uh, also, we wanted to make sure that others knew what it is that we do, how much labor is involved, which is quite a bit. Um, if you are in uh, either a volunteer position or a position where you're only working on an OER program half time, you are probably very aware of this. Uh, and so not only could you use the OER circuit for program managers for your own work or for um, anyone who's working with you, but you could also communicate and manage up uh, using the documentation of what are the current practices in OER initiatives. Well, here they are. Here's how much time that would take, that type of thing. Uh, when you're coming up with a job description, for instance, it would be cool to, uh, to take a look at something like this. 
So yeah, we had that in mind, but we also had creating a sustainable program in mind. A lot of us, when we got started, were uh, creating an entirely new kind of program. We had no idea what was going to happen and learned quite a few things as we went along. Um, some of the stuff that you'll see in here are processes that maybe weren't what we did at first, but we went, oh man, if we could do it all again, here's how we would do it. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of that in, in the text as well. So yeah, um, be sure to check it out. Uh, Aporva already has the link to it in there. Of course, it is free and it is uh, open licensed. If you want to use it to make new training materials uh, for folks who work with you and completely repurpose it, revise it, remix it, heck yeah, it's, it's an open resource. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick introduction to the book and what it's about and how you could use it. Uh, Aporva, do you want to do the agenda? Sure thing. Um, so what we're really going to do is spend maybe the next 15 minutes just walking you through the seven parts of the book that you see on this slide here. Um, Marco, Jeff, and I will take turns to just summarize briefly what you can expect in those parts of the book. And then also try to highlight what we see as um, the sustainability angle to, to those big parts or units of the book. Um, how can you think about those topics, whether it's about program management or collecting and reporting data Data, um, and set up the programs you might be running or starting um, for longer term success. We have, I think, five questions for you to um, engage us all in a little more of a, um, a discussion. And uh, I think we'll try to keep about 20 minutes um, of the hour for just questions and discussion that might be coming in. So with that, I think I can kick it off by chatting about the first part of this um, starter kit, which is a quick guide to open education. This is really the section of the book that introduces all of you to major themes and concepts around open education, the five R's, Creative Commons licensing. Um, I think it also features a case study by Cheryl uh, Killier Casey, who is on the call. So Cheryl, if you wanted to drop in a line or two in the chat about your case study and lessons learned, um, feel free to do that. Really what we're hoping um, you can take away from part one of the book is how to build a knowledge base for yourself um, as potential open education librarian, uh, program director, program manager, um, and other uh, supporters on your campus who might be working with you on this initiative. So, you know, these are the foundational pieces um, that you're probably going to be um, familiarizing yourself with or uh, pointing others to as they're getting started with their open education journeys. So ask yourselves questions like, where does that knowledge live? Is there a lib guide that you're creating for your OE program that has a quick list of references to all of the primer um, materials on open education? How is that information transferred? Is this all living in someone's head and do you have to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation every time you bring on a new staff member as part of your initiative? Um, look also at other resources. I think what's fantastic about this particular unit of the book is the bibliography and resources that point to you know, the history of the open education movement. So you don't have to rewrite the wheel and literally rewrite documents that explain how the open education movement has come to be where it is and what are the underlying principles behind it. But you can really point to the work that others have done. Um, and thank you, Cheryl, for linking to your case study and a lot of the lessons learned. I think there are a total of eight lessons that Cheryl has shared with us. Um, with that, I'll maybe pass it over to Jeff to tell you very quickly uh, about building an OER program. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so here's how you build an OER program. No, just kidding. Um, so th this is the second section of the book, and uh, there are two big chapters in here. They are both uh, primarily done by Abby Elder, um, and she goes through the kinds of things you'll want to consider when you're first piloting um, an OER program, when you're really just getting the whole gang together, when, when you are assembling the OER Avengers. Um, so it goes through things that you might want to consider when you're recruiting um, people at your institution. Um, 
if you have volunteers, do you want to rotate them every year? Um, do you want to get started with uh, administration or do you want to kind of go through a grassroots uh, type of method? Uh, and then there's some common OER partners in here, including libraries, teaching and learning centers, uh, faculty senate, student governments, um, online learning offices, if they're different from the teaching and learning center, uh, even the bookstore, and a little bit about dealing with the bookstore if they're a little bit hesitant about OER, um, along with all kinds of other partners and how to really let that team shine. Then there's one about talking about OER. Uh, some of these are going to be pretty obvious, like hey, there are plenty of options for adopting OER, um, but others you may not have considered. So for example, if you're starting a program and you're providing a, a level of support and you're offering your time to help out with uh, OER implementations, you may need to communicate what you cannot do or what you will not do. Um, along with all the stuff that you can uh, in order to manage everyone's expectations. I mean, you may not be able to, as an OER administrator on campus, uh, build everybody's OER course from scratch and uh, create all the tests and quizzes. No, you wouldn't want to do that. You also wouldn't say, hey, I'm going to mandate that everybody uses OER. That obviously not. But, you know, it may be something that you need to communicate to folks uh, as well. Um, a little bit in here about student engagement, um, about the kinds of issues that people encounter and how to communicate, how to mitigate things like that, like discoverability, of course, um, availability in particular subjects and particular courses, uh, the concept of quality and how it varies uh, per instructor, per department, per institution. Uh, so. A lot of, lot of stuff to consider in, in this uh, part. And then, of course, there is a case study. And that case study is from Regina Gong, uh, talking about two different OER initiatives that she was a part of. Um, and it's, it's really cool. Uh, to, it, if you've ever heard Regina before, it's cool to hear from her in any context. So it, she's got a case study right here for that. Um, yeah, I will pass it on to uh, Marco for program management. All right, so now we have a little rock block with Marco. I'm gonna do the next three sections. So um, Perva, if you can try to help me manage my time here, I'm gonna take about six, five to six minutes for these. Um, so the first section I wanted to talk about is program management. And I wanna distinguish that from project management, right? Program management is something that I feel like I wasn't necessarily that equipped to do coming in as a new open education librarian. Project management, yes, but program management is different, bigger, some of those concepts scaled up. So the chapter headings that we have under program management include common OER projects and programs. Um, this uh, chapter is by Abby and Jeff. And I think this is just great to familiarize yourself, uh, especially if you're someone who's coming in with a new program, like one that you're inheriting, right? So in my case, I started and inherited a recent program, but one that was already established and I didn't have input on the formation on. So I feel like that's just a great place to get an overview on common OER structures that you see out there. It's a great way to critique and revise what you're already doing. It's a great way to launch something new. Uh, similarly, that building a grant program, if you wanna have a grant element of your open presence, um, there's a lot of additional formulation that goes into that. So I think it's so helpful to have that specific support because I know a lot of us just haven't really received any kind of formal training on what does it mean to run a grant program? What are some of the things to consider? And how does that intersect with open in particular? Um, in this section, we also cover marketing your OER program and building familiarity on campus. And I put those two together because I think that they're conceptually tied. And so when we think about that, it's really, how do we let people know what your OER program is? How do we let people know what it does? And marketing, I think, you know, pretty clear what that means. Building familiarity, which is uh, one of the authors that, or one of the chapters that Jeff and I co-authored, that's really about how do you, um, foster conversation around open on your campus, right? How do you build, engage people's familiarity with open? How do you engage them around it? And I think you could pretty easily connect how all of these uh, functions go into sustainability, right? So when people know what your program is, when they recognize 
what your um, what your particular unit or institution's goal is around OER when there's that sort of brand recognizability, but also a mission recognizability, that is sustainability, right? That's no longer you having to go and sort of start from ground, ground level zero, building the case for open. People already know or have some, some familiarity with your program. Similarly, in that common OER projects and programs and building a grant program, there's a real emphasis on how you design your program, right? And the metrics that you build into it, the foundations that you build into it, and how that uh, in, enables its continued function. So th we mentioned, for instance, think about your strategic plans, student needs, and required metrics for funding, right? We all have um, open programs that are being funded and uh, resourced in different ways. And so what helps you to keep telling that story to keep your program uh, rich and moving forward? And so putting in those kind of metrics and measurements uh, your outputs right at the start is super helpful. So uh, this section also has two great case studies that I highly recommend that you check out. I found the case studies to be so hugely instructive. Um, I'm definitely someone who will feel like I've learned as much from this text as I have given to it. So um, thank you so much for all the case study authors for what they contributed there, because I, I find those practical examples so helpful. A uh, related uh, unit is the training and professional development. Uh, Stephanie Buck really did the, the main bulk of the work here with training your team and training future authors and adopters. And I think that distinction between those two is really important. It sort of acknowledges the kind of um, tiers of skills that you need or sort of complementary skills. And so that training future authors and adopters, I feel like that's also a great place to start if you're an OER newbie, because it's sort of like thinking about it from a, we'd say in the library, a patron facing perspective, right? And training your team is about how do you build those skills and that capacity internally? Um, and you really wanna think about this as well from that sustainability angle, right? Like durable, reusable training is sustainability. Um, it allows you to onboard new people. It allows you to offboard yourself onto other things. It allows you to keep your program growing outside of your individual presence. And for me, that's a real strong sort of bias, I guess I would say that I bring to this endeavor as the only person sort of tasked with open on my campus. I'm really aware of how much it's kind of resting with me and then I'm carrying it forward. So I really like what's in this chapter in terms of building that overall capacity for professional development as not only what do you do it, but how do you build those structures that make sure that that's a sustainable and ongoing part of your program. And then finally, we have supporting OER adoption. And I think this is what, um, you know, I think of as this really like rich instructional design work in my case, it's really where you're going to be doing oftentimes a lot of direct work with faculty or instructors. Um, in this particular chapter, we cover a lot of ground. We have supporting OER course conversion specifically, managing OER consultations, um, searching for open content, finding ancillaries for OER, making OER available in print. So this is really like a huge zone in here with a lot of information. And I really think that the main uh, takeaway in terms of the sustainability function is partly how do you take all of this activity and turn it into something that's scalable, replicable, and durable for you at your scale and to your institution's goals. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure that we got this quote in here um, and really emphasize that this is also a place to, to work with equity concerns in OER. So, um, that's one of my real passions in OER is the way that we can use this as an opportunity to uh, correct and trouble standard narratives and um, curriculums that have excluded people. And so really thinking about how do you build in whatever your OER programs, diversity and equity goals are, how do you build that in? And uh, Abby just has this note here, this should be in the presentation. So I wanted to make sure we got it in here. And it says, in an age concerned with equity and justice, and far less concerned with relatedness and cooperation, we shall almost always surely find it easier to join men in the traditional ways than to induce them to join us. Okay, so meaning in the current sphere, I'm gonna translate this into Marco speak. Um, it's kind of easier to join people in doing the wrong thing than it is to invite them into totally doing the new thing all on your own. And so OER is a great place to explore that. I'm gonna turn this back over to um, Aparva. And thank you so much for your time and attention on my sections. Thank you, Marco. And I appreciate you reading the, the quote and also reminding us that this, again, is not just about that project management work that you started off with, but it's really about training people 
for student success. That's sort of the goal of the work we're doing. Um, the next section of the book is also pretty detailed. Um, we talk about supporting um, open textbook creation. And a really quick you know, summary of this section would be it covers tools, documentation, and communication, and how those three pieces can become your best friends when you're setting up um, a program or you're uh, working on a course conversion or you're creating an open textbook. Um, really, I, I would say the takeaway from this particular unit of the book would be to take the time to plan projects judiciously up front. And planning is not only working in your spreadsheets or your task management tools, but it also involves conversations with faculty, with your um, centers for teaching and learning teams, with your office for students with disabilities or access offices. Um, and talk about the goals and impact you want to have with the OER you're creating. So this section really gives you an overview of how to manage just one project if you're starting off with just the one, one textbook, or how you can scale that up to manage multiple textbook projects at once. Um, if we were to think about this with more of a sustainability lens or perspective, um, I think it's really good to keep expectations and guidelines clear. Um, what uh, tools are you going to be using? What processes are you going to be using to develop your OER? Um, and does everybody involved uh, have access to these tools? Know which tools are being used so that that sort of workflow can continue to live on, even if you step away, if you're on vacation for two weeks or more, hopefully, or if you are um, maybe stepping into another opportunity at your institution or somewhere else. So make sure you're working with different departments and teams, whether it's your IT center, your library, your center for teaching and learning, so that all of the publishing efforts at your campus or in your institution or within your um, state system are spread out and documented. And they're not just hanging on the expertise or knowledge of that one person who is the OER person at your institution. Um, and also remember that the tools and technology and platforms also need to be uh, perhaps funded. So if you are in one of those power um, positions of power, you're managing the, the um, budget behind your OER program, build in some funding for maintenance of these tools and encourage the use of the tools that you're paying for. So if you have a subscription, say to the um, office suite at your institution, see if you can use Teams for calls instead of uh, another maybe video conferencing platform. Um, and remember to keep web accessibility in mind, because as Marco said, we're really designing with equity at the forefront. So you want to make sure that you're using all of the tools as well as all of the um, um, individuals on campus with the expertise to help with, say, web accessibility and making sure those resources are published um, with the widest usability up front. And I will turn it over to Jeff to tell us about our last, but I think one of the most exciting sections of the book, collecting and reporting data. Well, okay. Uh, I mean, speaking of accessibility, one of the first things that you learn when you're creating accessible materials is that if you don't build them accessibly at the beginning, it's very hard to retrofit them later and it takes way more time. Um, it's the same thing with data. If you don't have a good strategy at first, you don't have a good data collection method that you think is going to last you for uh, you know years and years down the line and allow for uh, really good reporting, then retrofitting that data strategy later on is really tough because then it's hard to match the data that you've collected before with the stuff that you've got later. Um, so these two chapters go through kind of the two different phases of dealing with data in an OER program. And the first one is having a data collection strategy and then collecting that data. And that kind of mandates that you have a strategy for your program overall before you even start with the data stuff. And then how do you uh, deal with all this data on the Excel side of things or possibly the Google Sheet side of things and also then create um, reports that people can understand with all of this stuff. You can make this data as transparent as possible and share it out. Uh, but if it's just a big giant spreadsheet full of numbers, 
you and a few other people will be able to make out what's what, and then the rest of the world is going to see that as opaque. Um, so it goes all the way from thinking about how to collect data and what kind of data to collect and what kind of data not to collect all the way through uh, the reports at the end. And yeah, the sustainability angles here are both the sustainability of the program, making sure that you have data that tells a story over a long period of time and can tell a story about what happened in this particular semester. And then also the sustainability of the work behind all of this. Um, there are many, many ways to do data work in OER programs that are not very efficient and will take up so much of your time that you're not doing anything else. And that's not sustainable to you or to anyone else who might uh, be walking into that program. So how can you make that data work efficient enough that it's a sustainable amount of time to devote, uh, especially given that not all of us do this full time? Um, that's doing uh, an entire OER initiative part time and dealing with the data and reporting part of it uh, can be extremely time consuming unless you've got a really good setup. So that's what these two chapters are about. They're about the processes that I would have started with uh, had I not jumped into it in 2014, um, if I could do it all over again. Uh, so yeah, and then we've got uh, Amy Hoper, uh, one of the uh, rock stars of Oregon, uh, talking about uh, data over in Open Oregon Educational Resources, uh, her amazing program over there. Um, so yeah, that's that's collecting and reporting data, and that is the uh, last section of the book. Thank you, Jeff, and hopefully that has been helpful um, for all of you, because as you can see, uh, one from the book, there are a lot of sections to think about when you are trying to build a program. Uh, and when uh, us editors got together to, to plan for this particular uh, uh, session and stage of the OEN certificate, um, we also realized that sustainability can't be separated out as you know, part number eight on sustainability, but it really has to be something that's woven in through every stage, whether it's the quick overview or all the way, as Jeff said, uh, to the data reporting piece. Um, at this point, um, we're actually going to engage a little bit more with you all. So you'll see some instructions on this screen here to join the uh, Mentimeter presentation. As I said, we have a few questions lined up um, for you all to do a little bit of reflecting on your own roles and your own programs um, and the sustainability pieces of those. So you can click on the link that I've just dropped into the chat or you can scan the QR code that you see on the screen here or visit www.menti.com and enter the code 39937800. So I'll give folks a minute or so to get in to this um, particular uh, poll. If anybody has issues uh, accessing the poll, please let us know. Marco, Jeff and I are all looking at the chat to help troubleshoot as needed. Um, and Kristen, yeah, I'm I'm excited to hear that this has already inspired you to reorganize the action plan <laughs> using the the outline of the book. All right, hopefully folks have been able to join the poll. I'm going to pass it over to Marco, but if you have trouble accessing this, please let us know in the chat. We're keeping an eye out. So, um, if y'all can take just a couple of minutes throw in some ideas. I will kind of narrate through and encourage conversation as I can so far. Student government, that's a great one. That one's also missing at the University of Idaho. Sometimes I'm not quite sure how to make that pitch to students because it's sort of like asking students to advocate on um, your behalf. Student, but I, th I think we have great ideas about how uh, you can connect with students as stakeholders and um, uh, allies, I guess, in the struggle. People who don't have direct power necessarily making those decisions, but do have a lot of a power. Uh, student government leaders, again, colleagues at the consortium, open liaison groups, um, OER committee. So one, I guess one, one issue with the way we worded this question is we don't know who's involved and who's missing in this list. So if I'm, if I'm taking a guess, I'm guessing that the people who are missing in this question are student government. Are folks, is that wrong? Are folks ha having strong participation from student government in their OER programs? 
feel free to say either something in chat or just unmute yourself and hop in. Yeah, who's missing student government? Okay, thank you. Thank you, participant, uh, digital strategies manager, library dean, our folks who are involved, student government. Yeah, it's a challenge to keep them involved. This is fascinating. And then we're seeing a lot of um, people who we might think of being involved with OER programs or OE programs, right? Like a li with the library, instructional design team, Center for Teaching and Learning. That sounds to me like a, a really great setup, but also a challenging one because you have to sort of coordinate the activity between the three. Um, Mandy in the chat says, we do have student government involved, but 100% agreed with Cheryl about the turnover issue. Cheryl earlier has said the annual turnover in officers is a challenge. And isn't that the truth, right? Um, having people rotate across these positions. Um, in my institution, I feel like faculty isn't rotating quite as much, but everyone has these positions where it's like four to five jobs in one role. So it's like, yes, I've been the OER librarian for five years and I've maybe had one year's worth of work on it effectively because it's like a 15% appointment to do that, right? So um, very interesting, the kind of responses here. Um, is anybody sort of struggling to identify who's currently involved in their open program? Do you feel like you have a sense of it to answer this question or? I feel like people were pretty quick with some responses here. I would love if when we were talking together as a group to maybe brainstorm this student government um, question and to sort of, you know, maybe have even some of our our case study authors who are here or our own experts sort of brainstorm that because that's um, it's a real question about what's the most compelling and uh, engaging ask for them? Um, if I might, uh, just yeah. looking at some of these responses, uh, two things that struck me were uh, just this comment about the support for OER leaders on campus. And I love that someone is thinking about really the, the administrative and logistics work that goes into running a program and making sure we're creating positions to help us do our roles better. So uh, big claps to whoever sent this comment in. And this one, um, I it struck me that uh, this commenter noted that their reference librarians maybe aren't as involved in the OER work um, than they had thought, which you would think is funny because these folks are located in the library. The library is really where the open education movement, it is the heart of the open education movement on many campuses. So it's really uh, interesting to see that even within the, the units and the departments where this work might be thriving, there are still people who can be engaged a bit more or pulled in a bit more. Um, and Lydia, I appreciate that you're noting, you know, burnout and overwhelm. So as, as Marco noted at the start, it takes so many people to do this work. Um, so the more people we can bring in to share the workload, but also the more mindful we can be about who is carrying what and what what does need to be put on pause so that um, we can all get through this together rather than burning ourselves out, I think is so critical. Yeah, who needs to be rotated in and out? Uh, I might take this moment to also mention that the OEN and Rebus community are actually offering a office hour session on legitimizing burnout in open education roles that's happening uh, on August 25th. And I'll drop a link into that in the chat for anyone who might be interested in joining that conversation. And I might pass it over to either Jeff or Marco to um, talk about our next prompt for all of you. Okay, um, I'll do this one. So the next question is, are there policies or strategic plans in place that can help your program continue and scale up over time or are there ways that you can influence policy creation? I think that's an inclusive or too. You can, you can have both. Okay, so we're seeing that uh, strategic plans at the university level and library level are in place, but not necessarily on the campus. Uh, building a fellows program for faculty OER adoption and creation. Um, no funding, but hoping uh, that it becomes more. Yeah, a faculty learning community or uh, a, a program that brings everybody together is a great step. Uh, a policy vacuum, it's hard to fill it while also admitting and running a program. Oh, yeah. 
And I'm sure that uh, administrative turnover also plays into that too. Uh, ESA is at the University of Arkansas, but student government created an ASG OER uh, director position. Uh, oh, uh, Student Government Association OER position. No, wait, no, AS, ASG. Okay, e, if you want to define ASG, that, yeah, sorry. Um, as an appointed position, this person usually has um, a first or second year student who shadowed them. It took two or three years to make this consistent. Uh, so it was kind of a turnover management type of thing. Uh, we have a textbook policy that encourages considering OER. That's very good. Uh, an affordability plan. Now we need a new and revised one. That task is challenging. There's resistance to new committees, uh, task force burnout. Yeah. Um, if you are running something called an initiative, uh, you'll hear about initiative fatigue almost immediately. Um, no funding yet, but, uh, but a policy that will concretely support OER. Uh, the best influence is through the faculty senate as you're an elected senator, that's really cool. Um, student affairs policy committee, campus partnerships, making sure that you're at the table. Uh, in the library strategic plan, not in the college's strategic plan. Uh, affordability, not clear that it's a strategic goal at the college, so assured that the president and admin are on board with our program at the library. Um, there seems to be uh, ideally there, uh, huge interest in OER. Okay, uh, seeing many things going on all at once on campus. Very cool, kind of seizing the moment. Um, some sort of centralized place for campus wide news sharing and information. Yeah, that would be really cool. Uh, I mean, we have a centralized initiative and we are still working on getting uh, news out in an efficient and organized and uh, effective way. Uh, the library is embracing affordability as a strategic goal. Um, we'd love to have a policy that educational content created by using university employees for as work for hire is automatically CC licensed. Wow, that's that's bold and awesome. Uh, we are at the beginning of a strategic planning reboot um, related to accreditation process and the new president. Uh, could be a good time to add OER. Yeah, that, that is a, a striking while the iron is hot type of thing. Uh, position to help policy along, but don't believe there's strategic plan place, uh, plans in place, but what happens when the grant funding is done? Yeah, uh, so that is a direct sustainability question. Um, there were, uh, uh, there was at least one position um, in one of our institutions here in Georgia where there was an OER coordinator. They were supported by a Gates Foundation grant, and at some point that grant ran out. And there was a transition year of, there, there were a couple of transition years getting from not having anyone dealing with OER to the teaching and learning center really taking that role on. Um, and the reason why it transitioned and then just fall away had to do with the student government association keeping it as a priority. Uh, so to bring it with the, uh, the other discussions, SGAs. Uh, the previous college strategic plan included OER adoption uh, as a strategic goal, which we highlighted as we built our program. Excellent. Okay, I am going to uh, move on to the next one. I believe that's either a Borba or a Marco. <laughs> I'll pass it on to, to Marco, and I'll just note that with this question in particular, we wanted to prompt you to think about how the OER work in your institution has a bigger context in which it's operating. So how can you connect your work maybe to um, the OER initiatives on, on the, the community college campus that might be in your city or other uh, institutions and colleges in your state? Um, who are you um, interacting with to make sure that the work you're doing is happening together? When we're thinking about a sustainable program, we're thinking of ones where you're connected not only to each other, but to the powers that be who are influencing this work. And these could be strategic institutional policies. This could also be policies at the state or government level as well that are around education or maybe even federal level policies if we're sort of scaling up. So it's not just about making sure that OER adoption or creation is part of the institutional plan, but hopefully over time we can also also influence maybe the Board of Regents or the Board of Education or the Ministry for Education within your state or region. All right, so our third question is, how can you scale your program to your capacity while still meeting needs? So I think I'm here 
costs? Like, what do you think is key to be able to scale the program to the capacity that you have in mind, your institution has in mind, your boss has in mind, while still um, meeting your own needs, while still meeting the needs of your people that you serve? I think that's what this question is getting at. So, and um, just to make some back channel conversation private, we're going to go through these next two questions a little bit quicker, or I should say make a private conversation public. We're gonna make these a little bit quicker um, so that we have time for more free flow questions. So how can you scale your program to your capacity while still meeting needs? So how, how do you uh, thread this needle of offering something but not overextending? If I was answering this question, I would say boundaries. Yeah, oftentimes oh. it's sustainability, <laughs> wonderful. Like and so, scaling up. So yeah. scaling down might also be a good way to begin to lay those foundations for a sustainable and larger impact program. This is great what we're seeing, uh, these brave folks who are answering this question in the chat. So um, having SOPs and good documentation well established, that to me is a way actually of connecting to what I said about boundaries. You know, we're laying out what we're going to do, what the rules are, what the accountability is. Um, pass some responsibility to faculty organizations and online learning. Um, so bring in other people, share the work, uh, many hands make works, makes work light kind of thing. Making a case for the uh, funding and staffing that's needed. Um, so I assume part of what you're saying here is, you know, you have to tell the story of what you need to the powers that be to get what you need to meet your goals, right? And I think that sometimes, um, that can be tough for us if you're not coming from a sort of entrepreneurial background where you're uh, got to get out there and kind of make a pitch to your dean or to somebody and to get some money. Um, I worked in uh, major gifts uh, briefly before grad school and all that. And I feel like that experience is actually very helpful in OER because it's a similar sort of um, you're telling a story. Uh, it's, it's like a nonprofit and that you're trying to connect people to the motive and then you're trying to get people on board and to give energy, money, time, commitment. Um, Clearly defined goals and expectations. Yes, exactly. Um, again, I think that that goes for both you and the people that you're serving in your open program, but also I'm um, trying to manage up as much as you can. Um, a, a purpose as, as she worked as a student fundraiser. Uh, great storytelling and narrative. Yeah, really a big part of this. How do you scale your program is asking for the help, getting the resources and a big part of that is telling the story. Um, someone says, don't, uh, don't want to discourage faculty who want to participate, seek collaborators among library staff, if not outside the library, right? So keep, be flexible about who you can collaborate with. I think this is a great point, um, especially in siloed institutions. Sometimes we don't fully consider staff um, and structures who aren't faculty in name, but are still doing all the same work. So be flexible about who you can seek out, including your team. And um, I have personally heard that in our attempt to establish a prestige OER program, that we accidentally alienated people who were interested in OER. Um, and so thinking about the sort of um, unintended effects of things is also very important when you're thinking about how to scale this program. You go, oh, it'll be great. We'll do a competitive application process that's gonna really boost our prestige and comp competition factor. Well, that didn't make sense really on a campus with only burgeoning OER interest, right? That actually kind of tamped some people down. We weren't in a position to make people kind of horse race for each other for uh, prestige grants. Uh, we got Pressbooks and it's helping a lot. That's great. Having a tool that works, having a platform that works that makes sense to you, an obvious place to build and publish and share. I have also recently gotten Pressbooks as part of our institutional setup and it's really nice. It's easier to tell people a story. I can send them actually the OER starter kit for program managers because I can clone it into our UI to Ho repository and I have a great example that I can show them of something I've personally done and also how it works. Okay, so I think we should go ahead and go on to the next question. Thank you everybody um, for those great responses. Um, you should have equity goals. Um, that's something that we mentioned in that project management section. How can you measure those goals through data? Um, and I would say data here is qualitative and quantitative and wild card, right? So I think we're curious to hear as much as we are to kind of share knowledge. What are y'all's ideas for how how can you measure and tell the story of how you're achieving those equity goals um, or not? And we wanted to end, uh, you know, the, the uh, discussion sort of uh, Q&A period with this question, because when we talk about sustainability, often we're thinking about equitable programs. 
So we really want to be pushing you all to think about those equity pieces of your, of your current program, if you're already managing one or as you're setting one up, um, what do you what impact do you want to be having with the work you're doing in open on campus? How do you want to measure that? How can you share that? How can you articulate um, uh, the value of the work you and others on your campus have been doing? So I'm double dipping and participating in the Mintimeter quiz as I facilitate it, but I put exploring measurements of impact beyond cost. Um, and I think that that's particularly important to me. It's been a research interest of mine. And so that the way that this looks is, you know, if somebody has a, a contribution that's the first in its field, which could be the first text in its field that appropriately represents minorities' contributions to this discipline, right? that we're trying to seek out new ways of acknowledging that impact of OER and open work. So for our university, it has been very much focused on cost and that's partly a functional thing so that we can report up to the powers that be for continued funding. It's also a practical thing. It's very easy, relatively speaking, for me to estimate the impact of financially the savings versus these uh, other goals in terms of equity, diversity and inclusion, it's tougher to measure. So thinking about ways of recognizing that, um, people say using Open Education Network's hub tools, if you're not familiar with that, that's kind of a custom dashboard through the Open Education Network that you can use to set and measure your own goals and metrics as you're facilitating your program. Um, someone says this is really tough for us as we do not have access to this kind of data as a consortium. So I think that's a great example where um, you could be a change maker in the sense of Establishing something very small then in your own OER program that engages with this is actually um, a, a big sort of training your colleagues in your environment about we have to do this, right? And so I don't even think that you have to have um, global DEI data from your institution to be able to track this. I think you could even just, you know, in your onboarding process with a grant recipient say, I actually have this question as part of my onboarding is just, how does the project engage with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion from your perspective? And I'm not prescriptive with people about that, but what I find is that just asking that question tends to start a conversation and get some ideas going, and then we have better accessibility, representation, student inclusion, participation, something, something that contributes to equity in a um, sort of putting a pebble on a pile kind of way. It's not totally um, perfect, but it's a contribution in that direction. Uh, stories from students can be really powerful, balance qualitative and quantitative stories about impact. I think that's a very great suggestion. Um, that student perception, uh, I, over there, similar question saying, student perceptions to your course materials reflect you and your identity. So actually thinking about our faculty instructors as our colleagues in this and helping to do course evaluation, course data collection. I've been working with this with my open grant recipients as well. How do we start surveying the students and saying, what's, what's the impact for, for you on this? And not just ask them about the cost, but ask them about the access, ask them about ex specific accessibility engendered by what we gave them, but also about those direct representation. So um, thank you everyone for, for these uh, great responses to this. I would love to kind of turn it over to us all now and kind of let it this last seven minutes be a place for any free form organic questions. Um, thank you all for your wonderful participation and um, inviting us here to speak with you all. Also, yep. a quick thank you to uh, Mandy Goodset, uh, who got the Zoom meeting together after uh, everything kind of uh, tipped over today. So it's super helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mandy. And really, as, as that slide said, we are opening the floor up to all of you to just chat. Um, feel free to unmute your microphone if you wanted to ask a question, share a comment or a story. Uh, you're welcome to drop in uh, anything into the Zoom chat as well if you don't want to uh, unmute your microphone. Uh, we really want to, to hear from, from you at this point. Thank you, Derek, and hopefully this has helped you also piece together which portions of the text might be useful to, to engage with first, because we know that it's hard to, to maybe dedicate the time to read the, the book front, uh, cover to cover, I guess. Hi, this is Susan. I'm an OER outreach librarian at Texas Women's University. I have inherited a really wonderful program. It's not used 
a lot. I mean, we get between 14 to 18 faculty every year who will buy into OER. But, um, and I've only been doing this for a year now. And in the back of my head, um, I, I'm reading more and more about arguments against OER. And I don't wanna sound negative because one of the reasons I was promoted into this position is because I'm kind of a Pollyanna just believing like, you know, I'll drink the Kool-Aid, I wanna promote this. It's great for students to, you know, retain and graduate, but, you know, the arguments against it, you know, inclusive access, faculty burnout. And now that we're going into our third year of COVID college, I mean, I feel it. I feel like let's do like, what's the easiest thing to do? Um, because we have to do so much COVID protocol. Anyway, I just wanted to vent. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love this book. I've never heard, I don't think I've heard of it before, but I'm going to share it with my colleagues. Um, thank you for your presentation, but I'm glad you mentioned burnout a couple of times because I'm feeling it. And I know the faculty, um, they revolted this year. I mean, they really, um, we had a revolt on campus because they were given so much extra work. And so this does seem like an extra thing to do. And I'm just proud of our faculty that, you know, they're so into university culture. Those are the people that are buying into it. Uh, it was Susan, right? Yes. Yes, th th thank you for your comments, Susan. I appreciate it. I also appreciate the chutzpah it takes to um, say some of those um, things and to be very candid in that way. And I think that um, first, I just want to make sure that we draw attention to Amber's uh, question in the chat, which is asking for OER policies. So if you happen to have any available, just in case folks have to log on, log off right at noon, um, Amber's asking for those. So Susan, I, I think this is a really great point. Um, I wanna sort of just answer concisely a few things that you mentioned. So I think one really great success of publishers is to cast inclusive access as somehow similar to open. And it's really just a crappier version of the product that they already sell, in my opinion. It's a reduced option textbook that you don't get to keep, that you get to rent for a period of time. And if you fail this class and need to take it again, well, then you're gonna need to go and re-up and get that inclusive access again. Um, and I think what you said about burnout is uh, incredibly relevant, incredibly compelling. And my personal opinion is we probably shouldn't be trying new initiatives in over the past two years the way that we have. My libraries in Idaho were one of those states that we kept our library open the whole past two years, right? We have continued business as usual and it's a point of pride. Um, we'll even contrast ourselves to WSU and say, oh, they shut down and we kept going, right? I personally am immunocompromised and haven't left my house in two and a half years. So I have a very different perspective than my institution. Um, and the burnout is very real and tangible. I will say in reading a lot of research about burnout, it's interesting how the solution is not to make everything easier. Um, burnout is a genuine physical and psychological condition that occurs from work. I think it's very interested that, interesting to me that it's listed I think in OSHA as like an actual workplace related injury, right? This isn't a personal deficit, which I think the ableism in our society often perpetuates it that way. You're not tough enough. And it's like, no, this is like going to work and getting exposed to like toxic fumes or something, right? Like it has this cumulative effect on you that isn't under your control. Um, in terms of some of the remedies that you see, it's actually more investment in the work that is meaningful to you. And it's been really interesting for me to see some of my faculty continue their OER development work through this horrible chaos and actually find it as a place of, um, I would say connection either to students or to the work that they're doing or to themselves. And so I think that the way that we situate it is not, this is extra work. I feel like if you're in a role where that's what your system is asking you to do, um, you have my deepest empathy because I think that's a horrible sell to try to do right now. But what I try to frame it as, it's a way to get deeper into the work that's meaningful you, meaningful to you. Um, it's not a way to do something extra, right? And so that's where I feel like those equity goals come in, where you say, like, what does this enable you to do that you're not doing already? 
um, how can we actually make things easier for you? But thank you, thank you so much for those remarks there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop talking. If anyone else wants to comment on that or any other questions, we'd be happy. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. And I'm actually gonna quote Marco here. Um, during our planning conversation, he mentioned that sustainability is always a moving target in the digital landscape. And I think thinking of um, the, the, that human element is part of that consideration. Um, so it, it's it's challenging to think about how fragile open education movements or initiatives can be, but we we do need to prioritize um, faculty time and uh, commitment or resources on campus and then scale down again, as we mentioned, sustainability is not just about scaling up, it's about um, creating manageable expectations uh, and uh, workloads for you. It's also not an add on. It's not like a nice to have, but it's really something that should be part of our programs every step of the way. Um, and we hope that this, this our session has helped you think about the different ways in which you can begin to put that angle back into your conversations with your teams, with um, the powers that be at your organization, or even just in conversation with one another. Um, I think that's really the key part of um, the value of the activities to make sure that the programs have a good path forward um, that, you know, the time you're investing in this work is not just for a quick short term solution, but it is something that is going to um, last on campus. Um, I know we're just one minute over our scheduled hour. So if anybody needs to step away, please go ahead and I'll say thank you for being such a wonderful audience, but I'll pass it back to Jeff if he has any final words to, to round us off. Well, I just want to thank you all for, for coming and for uh, checking out the text and, and for contributing so many cool perspectives. Um, I, I put some things in chat uh, for Susan because I'm very familiar with uh, TWU and I think it's really cool that you're in that role and that that role exists. That's really neat. Um, yeah, uh, if you ever have any questions about um, the text or any questions for us in general about our roles about things we may have written in the text or anything that doesn't have anything to do with the text, please uh, reach right out to us. Um, I'll just put my email right here in the chat, uh, just in case you want to send an email. Um, but yeah, we've got contact info, I believe, uh, on the Pressbooks text as well. So yeah. Well, take care, everybody. Uh, enjoy your weekend. And Mandy, any final words from you? We're happy to share a link to the Mentimeter slides and responses so you can have that to re refer to afterwards. That would be great. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. We really appreciate it. Have a great Thanks, weekend, everyone. everybody. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. See you later. <laughs>